Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to Honey in the Rock. Wonderful and marvelous is Jesus to me. Sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb is he. Jesus is real, he'll never fail. I will love him now and throughout all eternity. He tastes like honey in the rock. He tastes like honey in the rock. He tastes like honey in the rock. Oh, taste and see. The Lord is good. He tastes like honey in the rock. Bump, bump. And that bump, bump is for Maddie. Maddie is our five-year-old listener to Honey in the Rock. Now, today's a little different. We usually do Honey in the Rock live stream on Facebook. But for some reason, there are difficulties, technical difficulties, for live stream on Facebook today. So I'm going to try something different that I've never done before. I'm going to just video Honey in the Rock and then try to upload it to our YouTube channel. So let's give that a try. So we're going to sing a couple of songs like we always do, but first we're going to pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much, Lord, that you give me the opportunity to share from your word, to share songs that we will worship you together, Lord, and to share our prayer request. I pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon us, that you'll give us wisdom, discernment, and good judgment, and you'll draw us close to you, Lord. And I pray that this time of us worshiping you, that we would uh, put a smile on your face and that you would receive our worship. And I pray for all the people who are watching live stream wherever they are. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, minister to their deepest needs and you would soften their hearts, that they would draw closer and closer to you. That is our goal, Lord, that we would draw closer and closer to you. We love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do, cause nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you. You're all I want, you're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. Thank you, Lord. You know, I just realized something. We've been doing this for a year and a half. I think a little more than a year and a half. Uh, March 2020. And some of you who are watching probably on YouTube have no idea who we are or what we do. So I'm going to give you a, a brief um, intro right here. March 2020, last year, there were a lot of people who were really freaking out about COVID, and rightly so. We didn't really know what was going on. We didn't know who to believe. A lot of us couldn't go to church. And I said, Lord, how can I encourage those? Because you know that, that my desire is to encourage the body of Christ and those who don't know you, but definitely the body of Christ, to encourage and exhort whenever I can. Can I do a live ministry? I knew nothing about it. And so the Lord just helped me to do this little set in my extra room. I set it up and just started praying and worshiping the Lord together a cappella. I said, Lord, I can't play keyboard anymore. Can't play, play guitar anymore. Um, I have limited use of my arms now. And so I said, what can I do? So he showed me what to do. We put up this little set and uh, I just share from my heart what the Lord has given me for that day. And people from all over the country, all even other country, even other countries, are listening to Honey in the Rock live stream every week. Then, I, then the Lord gave me a little nudge about YouTube, so I started putting us on YouTube last month. So we have a few people that trick, trickle in from YouTube who aren't on Facebook, and I just thank God to be able to minister to anyone who's hearing my voice today. What I'm doing right now, I'm just recording this on my phone. And hopefully, I'll be able to upload this video on YouTube and on Facebook because of the technical difficulties on Facebook today. And this has never happened to this 
uh, extent where I absolutely wasn't able to go live stream. So that's what we're doing. So we're going to um, sing a couple of worship songs. It's important to spend time worshiping God and telling him how much we love him. And we do this together. We're kind of a little family now. There are people every week who come on and sometimes they respond. Now today there won't be responses because I'm just, I'm just doing a video from my phone. But for whoever's listening, please join us as we sing to the Lord. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. You're my glory, you're the lifter of my head. Hallelujah, 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 you're the lifter of my head. Amen. Again, I don't know what I'm doing. This is something that we've never done before, but we will uh, do the best we can. Our main purpose is to worship the Lord, spend time with him, draw close to him, and let him minister to our hearts as we minister to him and minister to one another. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Amen. Now I'm going to read this. This is like a prayer. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. And you know, that's a whole message in itself. I love that song. I have a few songs here. We usually sing more than this, but um, because today's was kind of crazy, the technical difficulties and all the other stuff that happened last night and this morning over here at my home. Uh, but I want to sing this as an old, old song. I love it so much. <coughs> Some of you who might be old like me, you might remember Catherine Kuhlman. I used to go to her services back in the 70s at the Shrine Auditorium, and she loved this song. It's one of my favorites. And those of you who haven't uh, listened to Honey in the Rock before, you'll kind of get used to it if you watch us again. This is just uh, up close and personal. Um, nothing is uh, planned ahead of time. I have some scriptures I've written down for the message about Samson today. But um, but I, I just let the Lord lead me, and I've known him for a long time, since 1970, and I let him lead me, and I'm just a person. I make mistakes sometimes, but bear with us, because those of us who watch Honey in the Rock, we are a part of the Honey in the Rock Ministries group. We love him. We love him. And we love to share about him and talk about him and sing about him. So we're going to do our best <coughs> singing this next song. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now i know he touched me and made me whole since i met this blessed savior since he cleansed and made me whole i will never cease to praise him i'll shout it while eternity rolls he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. We're only going to sing the songs one time today because I'm not used to what I'm doing and I want to get right to the message, but there are some. Oh, great. Thank you, Lord. And you know, sometimes I can't sing those other verses to, <coughs> excuse me, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. I'm still trying to get my daughter, Tina, to do some worship for us. And I'm hoping my grandson, Moses, and his bride-to-be, Casey, uh, can do some worship for us at some time in the future. They're actually getting married this Saturday. Today's Monday. They're getting married this Saturday. Really looking forward to that. Okay, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place holy spirit thou art welcome in this place omnipotent father of mercy and grace thou art welcome in this place again the top line holy spirit Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome in this place. Amen. And I forgot how to sing those other stanzas again. Sorry, guys. Like I said, we're just, there's nothing planned. There's nothing staged. This is just 
as we go. I already did the anointing. I anointed myself, the Bible, my phone, and just go by what the Lord leads. You know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and another they will not follow. And a sheep is a grown lamb. And I've been knowing the Lord since January 1970. So if I'm not grown by now, that that's a problem, right? Okay. Yeah, and people can't <laughs> people can't respond because we're not live stream. Anyway, uh the last two weeks we talked about Samson. What a guy. Samson was so anointed of God. I'm going to give a really brief overview of Samson. Before he was born, an angel appeared to his mother. We only know her as Manoah's wife. An angel appeared to her and told her she was going to have a, a son. She was a barren woman. And the angel told her she was going to have a son. And before he was conceived, he was called out to be a Nazarite before he was even born. Like I said, before he was even conceived. And we can read up on the Nazarite uh, vow in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. I'm not going to go over it again. But a Nazarite, just to give you an overview, from the day they're born, they can't cut their hair. A Nazarite is someone who is uh, holy and separated unto the Lord. That's basically what it means. And so Samson was to not have his hair cut from the day he was born at all to cut his hair that's part of his vow, and also to stay away from wine or strong drink or even the fruit of the wine, uh, the fruit of the vine, uh, grapes, and also raisins. And there's a long story about the raisins and the grapes, and I can tell you another time, but the grapes and raisins have to do with the fruit of the vine. He wasn't even supposed to be near a vineyard. Uh, and he wasn't supposed to touch anything dead. Even if someone he loved, one of his loved ones died, he couldn't touch the dead body. He had to be completely holy and separated unto the Lord. And I love how, how God's word says of Nazarite vow, not even a grape or a raisin. I mean, nothing that has anything to do with the fruit of the vine, with, with, uh, with wine or with alcohol. To stay so far away from it. God doesn't want us to be compromisers. Don't even look at it. Don't, don't get close to it at all. So I love that. So we found out the last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks we talked about. I started to say Moses. Gosh, I hope I don't say Moses while I'm talking about Samson. But uh, we saw Samson as a, as a man who was a compromiser. Uh, he was always going down somewhere, going down into Temna, going down, going down. He was always doing things out of his um, desires, his fleshly desires, and he was not obedient to God and not obedient to his Nazarite vow. He saw a woman in Timna. What was he doing in Timna? Timna was near a vineyard. He wasn't supposed to even be near vineyards. And you can read about this in uh, Judges, starting with chapter 14, I believe it's with chapter 14 let me see i love my old bible there's so much writing in it and it's so pages falling apart but i love this old bible it has seen me through some tough times and when judges we've read a lot in judges about samson and all the things that he was he wasn't supposed to do and he did them anyway and he did a lot of those things. But, you know, today what I want to talk about, and I'll kind of backtrack here and there. So if you have your Bibles and you want to look at your Bibles, I'll give you the Bible verses. But this Bible is so falling apart, but I love it. Um, so what I want to talk about today is all the mistakes that Samson made. And I'm going to reiterate some of those mistakes that he made. But what I want to talk about he was so far from God. He was such a compromiser. He let his lust uh, rule his life. He didn't make good decisions. He didn't make godly decisions. He was so proud and arrogant because of vengeance and because of anger. He slew those men and he and he tied the tails of the um, of the foxes together. I don't think they were really foxes. One of the translations in the Bible says foxes. It was there was some kind of animal. I forget what they were. And now see if we were doing live stream, Rhody or Valerie or somebody would tell me what those animals were because I forgot. But anyway, uh, 
he tied their tails together and set them on fire and let them go into the, all the fields of the Philistines to burn up all their fields. He did some terrible things. God was still with him and God still had his hand on him. And sometimes we think when a person is anointed, that means their life is perfect. No, it doesn't. God calls those who he calls. And he's always hoping that they'll follow him and do things the right way. And sometimes they don't. But you know, what is that verse? Uh, you know, God's, I used to tell my mother, God's not asleep on his throne, mother. God's not asleep on his throne. He pays attention to all these things. And there comes a time when God says enough is enough. Anyway, but with Samson, what happened at the end of his life, and I want to read this, I want to read in Hebrews, all the mistakes that he made, and I am going to reiterate and talk about them a little bit. But what I want to say is this, all those things that he did, he was a lustful man. He went into prostitutes. He stayed with uh, Delilah, who was a Philistine. He stayed with Delilah, Delilah night upon night upon night and had this physical relationship with her outside of marriage. And he loved her so much. And he just hung out with her in this, you know, physical relationship for a long time. And she was kept trying to find out his secret. And he just was a lustful man. But this is what God said about him. In Hebrews chapter 11, we know that as the Hebrews kind of walk of faith, talks about all these men and women of faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered under God, unto God. Now listen to this. By faith, Enoch was translated. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, he sojourned. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, Sarah. All these people of faith, all these people of faith, listen to this. They die, they all die, all, I'm going to circle that word. Where's my pencil? Where's my red pencil? They all died in faith. Okay, they all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, and you see, I write a lot of stuff down. And so then the, then again, verse 17, By faith Abraham, accounting that God was able to raise him up. By faith, verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith Jacob. By faith Joseph. All these people, by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith Moses. By faith Moses. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is pleasurable, but my friends, when the season is over, it's over. And then I'm telling you, the devil bites us in the rear end and says, ha, gotcha. Okay, in verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt. Through faith, he kept the Passover. By faith, by faith, the walls of Jericho. By faith, the harlot Rahab. By faith, by faith. Now listen to this, verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell. He didn't have time to write about all of it. To tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson. I cried when I saw that this morning. He was such a messed up guy. He had God's call in his life and he just constantly went after the things of the flesh. And he said, by, and then where does it say? Let me read this again. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell you of... Samson and then the, he said he names all these people and he said who through faith and he's talking about Samson through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness obtained promises stopped the mouths of lions quenched the violence of, of fire escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness they were made strong in verse 36 and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings yea more were of bonds and imprisonment all these things and this was this was talking about samson now i'm going to go back 
I hope it makes sense to you guys. I'm bringing I'm I'm bringing out a point today that I haven't made before. <coughs> all those things, all those things that Samson did, he went down. He went down, always looking in the wrong direction. His parents gave him direction, but his lust for things that were taboo, he did them anyway. He had no self-control. He made selfish choices. He did not follow God's choices. Lust defined his body, bodily appetite for pleasure. Samson went down, down, down. Where was that verse? Sorry, guys, can't find the verse. There were things that he that's things he didn't he didn't cut his hair yet. <coughs> Here it is, verse 14. And Samson went down to Timnath. He should have found a woman in Dan from his own tribe, but he didn't. <coughs> he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, and he came up came up and told his father and his mother, and he said, Go get her for me. I want her. I want this woman. And so Samson again. Then went Samson down, verse 5, and his father and mother, and his father and mother did what he said. They should have said, you're not supposed to go to, with the Philistines, but whatever. Who can tell their kids anything, right? And Samson at that time was probably about 18 years old. And then Samson went and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and that's what he saw a lion. And isn't that interesting? I didn't recognize that until today. He went down to the uh, to go to Timnath, and it was by the vineyards. He wasn't supposed to even be near Tim vineyards. And it's like God had the lion come out to stop him from going to the vineyard. So what did Samson do? He didn't turn around and go in the other direction. He just went and grabbed the lion and just broke him to pieces, just like he was a little goat or something. And he did that out of anger or whatever, just showing his, he seemed like a very arrogant man and just showing his, his powerful, you know, strength or whatever, and just killed the lion and then uh, went on his way. And then we know that when he came back, after he came back along the way, after he left Timnath and Timnath and he came back along that way, he went to see how the lion was doing and it was it was dead, and, and bees had made a honeycomb in the carcass of a lion. He wasn't supposed to be by anything that was dead. But he went to that dead lion, and he not only touched it and saw it, but he ate honey from that dead lion. He wasn't supposed to do that. And he even took the honey to his parents and said, Oh, look at this delicious honey. He even gave some to his parents. This guy, I'm telling you, he did all these things. And it's such a shame that he had no conviction and no remorse. Remorse. And one of the things I wrote down was he had no self-control. He made selfish choices. He didn't follow God's choices. Uh, so he just wanted bod bodily appetites to be uh, satisfied. He just wanted pleasure. Samson went down, down, down. And it's like a snowball. You know, if you take a snowball and you put it at the top of a mountain that's full of snow and you let the snowball go down a mountain. Remember cartoons when we were kids? We'd see cartoons of a snowball at the top of a mountain. And once it gets down towards the bottom of the mountain, the snowball is huge. It just keeps picking up more snow. Well, that's like sin. Once we let open the door a crack and we walk in that door, then we just open ourselves up to more sin, more sin and more sin. Compromise, compromise leads to more compromise okay so samson went down samson went down 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 and sin blinds us okay let me judges 16 where's this now i want to i want to remind us a little bit about delilah you know the devil had a plan the devil had a plan for samson and he set up the perfect person to fulfill his plan and that person was delilah she was beautiful and i started to say moses again gosh samson fell in love with delilah and she was really a very sensual woman and we can read we talked about it a lot last week but um she kept tricking him samson why don't you tell me about your strength 
you know, and he would tell her all these things, which wasn't true. He should, he just should have said, right out, I'm not going to tell you about my strength, but he had already stepped the foot, his foot in the door of sin and pleasure and compromise and forget about obedience to God. And here he is with this woman. She's stroking his hair. Oh, come on, Samson. Do you really love me? Um, tell me where your strength is. And so, because the Philistines wanted to uh, subdue Samson, they wanted they wanted to kill him. They had it out for him because he had killed some of their men and their stuff, like I said, that I talked about last week and the week before. But, so they paid Delilah and said, trick him and get him to tell you where his strength is so we can get him. We want this guy. So Delilah, Delilah, um, said to all these things oh you don't really love me if you really love me you would tell me and so he would tell her different things oh if they bind me with new ropes or whatever um that my strength would be gone and then they did the philistines did because delilah told them oh samson said it was the new ropes or whatever so then that didn't work so she said samson you lied to me you didn't you don't really love me you really tell me your strength so this kept going on time after time so finally Delilah, the beautiful, seductive Delilah, sin, wore him down. And Samson finally said, okay, I'll tell you, my strength is in my hair, which we know wasn't true. It wasn't his hair that made him strong. The hair was a symbol of his vow to God. I'm never going to cut my hair because I'm going to be sanctified and holy unto you. And so that was Samson's... Uh, Samson's strength was not in his hair. It was in his vow to God. And it was a symbol. His hair was only a symbol. So anyway, so this is what Samson Samson told her. And that he should have just messed up. He shouldn't have messed up like that. He put his foot in the door again. He should have just said, I'm not telling you. That's it. And he should have just turned around and ran. But he didn't turn around and run. But he didn't do that. So he told her. And sin blinded him and tricked him. We think that we can, uh, you know, we can't play with fire. Some, someone said that we can't play with fire and not get burned. We can't. It's impossible. So Samson got burned big time. And the enemy used Delilah. And so Samson was willing to turn. Okay, no, that's not true. I started to say Samson was willing to turn back to God, but he wasn't. So the Philistines came upon him. They were furious. Samson couldn't get out of it. His hair was cut. His vow was completely broken. He kept compromising and compromising, but his vow was completely broken. And then the, the Philistines got him. They brought a barber in and they shaved his head. Delilah didn't cut his hair. The barber shaved his head. And then she shaved his head and then they gouged out his eyes. And then they decided to, let me see if I can read that part. Okay, here we go. Okay, verse 19, so it's Judges 16, 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he was not able to, because the Lord had departed from him you know if we cross the line too many times god gives us so many opportunities to return to him once we've compromised and backslidden he gives us so many opportunities and then at, at some point he says okay your heart is hardened that's it so it says the lord was not with him and the lord departed from him verse 21 but the philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down again down to gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. It doesn't say here how long he was in that prison grinding that, that uh, he was um, blind, his head was shaved, he was in chains, and he was grinding on the grinding wheel day after day, day after day, morning, noon, and night. And he was doing that, and I bet he had time to think about, oh my gosh, what have I done? And he had time to repent, because this is what it says in verse 22. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. And then 
Maybe he felt the hair on his head. It doesn't say. It says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto, da unto Dagon their god, and to rejoice, for they said, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. They hated Samson. And we talked about a lot of stuff last week and the week before. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, which is Samson, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry, and they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. We want to make fun of him, that jerk, you know. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. He, they laughed at him and made fun of him, and they set him between two pillars, and Samson said unto a lad, a young boy, that held him by the hand, He said, Permit me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house stands, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof. It just makes me cry when I read this. He was so grateful to give his life, his life, and to be a martyr, because his whole life he messed up. And he was willing and he trusted God that he had faith in God that God was going to give him his strength back. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. They made fun of him. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I have. O oh Lord God, remember me. I pray thee, and strengthen me. He probably said one last time. I pray thee. Oh, he did. <laughs> Only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, and of one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael in the burying place of Manoah his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Okay. I have to say this. You know, God is so merciful. God could have said, you know what? Forget it, Samson. All your life you messed up. You never, you were never obedient to me. You just messed up all the time. You, were, you followed after your own lust. You did this, you did that. God could have told him all of the mistakes that he made. But God did not do that. And I'm talking to somebody and somebody's hearing my voice right now. And you feel like God maybe has forgotten about you or maybe you can't even talk to God anymore because you feel like you messed up so bad. It doesn't matter. Read in Judges about Samson and see how many times he did things the wrong way and he didn't have any, uh, he didn't feel any remorse about it at all. He was very arrogant. He didn't seem to care about it at all. He just kept messing up, messing up. And he was called of God before he was even conceived, it was like a prophecy. When you have, you're a barren woman. He said to Manoah's wife, we don't know her name. He was, you're a barren woman. You're going to have a child. And from the time he's conceived, he will be a Nazarite set apart for God. And he never did what God wanted him to do until the day he died. And I'm saying, we don't, we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know when our time is. Time could be short. We need to make that promise to God now. We need to come back to him now. For those of you who have been compromisers, you know who you are. Other people might not think you're a compromiser, but you know who you are. And you know you have been a compromiser. And I know there's somebody listening to the sound of my voice who's been a compromiser for years. You've been going to church. You've been going through the motions. You've been singing to the Lord. Maybe you're even on the worship team. You're, you've been doing things for the Lord for so many years, but you're... Um, I'm sorry. To, well, I'm not sorry to say this is the truth. You, there's someone who's been a hypocrite. You've been a hypocrite for so long and you're so used to being a hypocrite. You think that's what a Christian is. I got news for you, whoever you are. The Bible says, I don't have the scripture right now. I'll find it for next week. The Bible says um, 
that not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. Jesus said that. Some of them came to Jesus and they said, what about us? They, they, they couldn't go into heaven. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And they said, what do you mean? We did all these things in your name. We cast out devils. We did all these miracles in your name. And he said, I never knew you. So I'm saying to somebody today, if you have been a compromiser and you know if you are or not, and if you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, today's the day to repent. Today's the day to turn your life back to God. And for some of you who've never completely surrendered your life to God, this is the day to do it. We're not promised tomorrow, my friends. We're not. And then, okay, do I have time to do this? I think I do. Um, there's something I wanted to share with you, and it's, let me see, okay, I talked about the Hall of Faith. I wanted to share with you, you know, like, okay, Samson had a chance to repent and get right with God before he died, but people sometimes are, like, killed in car accidents or whatever, or a sickness, and and we never know what our time is. We don't always have a warning. We don't always see that it's it's something that's impending, that's coming. So today's the day of salvation. Now's the day. And I want to share with you something that I call the click of the gate. I'm not going to tell you all the details of the story. But in the 90s, the Lord, I don't like to use the word vision, but it was a vision because I saw it and it was like a moving picture. So I guess that's a vision. I just don't like to use that word. I think it's overused sometimes. But the Lord showed me something. I was in a compromised place in my life. And I was talking to the Lord about it, but I wasn't completely repentant. And then I got to the point where I was completely repentant. And I said, God, how do I get myself in these messes? How can I how can I be warned ahead of time? And the Lord, then I saw a picture, and I'll show you what I saw. I saw myself walking on a dirt pathway with Jesus, and we were going kind of at an upward slope. And on the right and on the left, on the right, I think it was sloped downward, and there were some trees down below or whatever. But on the right... Um, I saw it look kind of like a forest or something, something like that. There was a lot of brush and stuff. And then all of a sudden, when I looked, just glanced towards the right, I saw a gate, like a, a white picket fence gate. And I said, I looked at it and I paused and I said, hmm, I wonder what's, what's in that, what's, uh, you know, beyond that gate. And I turned around and looked, and Jesus was about, at first I was side to side with him, but then I looked, and he was a couple feet in front of me, like maybe four feet in front of me. And uh, I try not to exaggerate. It was about four feet in front of me. Then I glanced over to the right again, and I saw the gate, and this time it was unlatched. It was like opened, like I could just walk up to it and open the gate. It wasn't latched. And I went, hmm, I wonder what's beyond that gate. And I looked up and Jesus was then maybe about six or eight feet in front of me. And I thought, oh, I can catch up. And so I turned, looked at the gate and it was beautiful. And I approached the gate and it was a beautiful white picket fence gate. And beyond the gate, I saw beautiful trees and flowers and like a gorgeous garden, but I couldn't see very well. And I wanted to open the gate, open the gate and walk in that gate to see what was in there. It was mesmerizing. It was just beautiful. And then I walked up to the gate and I put my hand on the gate and I started to open the gate and I thought, well, I wonder where Jesus is. And I turned and looked and he was quite a bit further, like I'm trying to tell you from here to that door. But <laughs> He was like maybe 12 feet in front of me and I thought, oh, I can still catch up. So I looked at the gate, I walked up to the gate, I opened the gate and this was all like a moving picture that I saw. I opened the gate and I stepped inside. I stepped one foot inside the gate. And I turned around and I saw Jesus and he was about maybe the length of one house, like one house away from where you live. If you stood in front of your house, like like the end of one house, what is that, 30 feet? I don't know. But he was about 30 feet in front of me and I thought, oh, I can still catch up. I have plenty of time. I wonder what's inside this garden. It was beautiful and it was mesmerizing. And I walked a little further and it was full, full, full of flowers, trees, vines. It was beautiful and gorgeous, but it didn't look like it was kept up by a gardener or anything because it was so full. 
And so I turned around and I couldn't see the gate very well. I thought, oh my gosh, how did the gate get so far away from me? So I made my way to the gate and I looked up and Jesus was far down the path. And I thought, I still have time to run up, to run and catch him. So I turned around and then when I turned around to go further into that garden, I realized like when a person is in a forest late at night, I didn't know my way out. I realized and I felt a little panicky like, oh my gosh, where's the gate? Am I going to be able to get out of here? I did find the gate, but when I got to the gate and looked to see where Jesus was, he was so far down the path, I could barely see him. And I thought, gosh, can I even run up to catch him? And I looked at the garden one last time, then I looked to where he was and he was gone. I couldn't see him at all. And then I panicked. And this was in the vision. And I said, Lord, oh my gosh. And so I panicked and I said, I don't, I don't, I can't find my way back to you. What am I going to do? And I heard his voice, an audible voice. And he said to me, when you hear the click of the gate, and then he didn't say anything else. And I said, what does that mean? And then the finish, the finish, uh, then the vision perished. I couldn't see it anymore. It vanished. And so I thought, oh my gosh. So the kind of like the moral of the story is when you hear the click of the gate, don't even turn your head. Don't even turn to look to see what's beyond that. Continue to keep your eyes on the Lord. And I told my daughter about that. I told her about that. She was a teenager. I told her the story of the click of the gate. And then it was like the next day or something. Some, uh, some guy called me and I knew the Lord didn't want me to talk to him anymore. And he called me on the phone and he was saying like he wanted to go to church and stuff. And I said, you can find a church yourself. I'm not going to, I don't need to take you to church. And then I heard, I heard the word really loud, click. And I thought, and I just said to him, look, you can find a church yourself. I'm not going to take you to church and I don't want you calling me anymore. And I hung up. And I had told my daughter of the vision and she said, mom, you heard the click, didn't you? And I said, I did. And so that was so thrilling. So that's the message about the click of the gate. And another time the Lord um, reminded me of the click of the gate. And I can share that another time with you guys. But I wanted to share this with you for anyone who's listening to my voice. Be careful because the enemy has a trap for us. He's real. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. He's out for us. He's out to get us. Ask the Lord to make you aware of the click of the gate, to make you aware of those temptations before you fall into the quicksand. Ask the Lord to help you with that, and he will. So that's that's our message for today. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I just have this on video. I hope and pray that I'll be able to put it on um on um honey in the rock and i hope and pray that i'll be able to put it on uh on um youtube i wanted to remind you of this book about samson it's one of my favorite books by one of my favorite pastors who's in heaven now steve mays and it's called crossing the line the compromised life and it's the story of samson you can get it on amazon i think it's about ten dollars on amazon but you can get it at the calvary chapel um what is that place called that Calvary Chapel uh, Capistrano, uh, you can get that on the, in their bookstore, and it's called Crossing the Line, The Compromised Life by Steve Mays. Excellent book. It's the best commentary I've ever read on Samson. Best Bible study I've ever heard. It's just phenomenal. Anyway, I really wanted to uh, plug that book. It's really important. The next, now what we're going to do next is we're going to pray for the people in our prayer book. This is my rickety old Bible that I love so much. It, I can't even lift it with one hand. It'll completely fall apart. I have another Bible. I have lots of Bibles, but this, this is my tried and true Bible right here. Okay, so now... This is what did I write myself a note. Pray for Michelle, Jean Perot's family, and Gigi. Okay, there are a lot of people in this prayer book. We have a lot of prayer requests. We have a lot of praise reports. And some people, one time someone said, "What? why is my name in there? So I don't, uh, I don't show the names anymore because some of them are confidential. 
Okay, but this is our honey prayer request book. So now we're going to pray. And I've already anointed the prayer book and myself with oil. So we come before you now, Lord. And you know we always pray in the name of Jesus. We don't have to tag, tag on that phrase in Jesus' name. We do it out of habit, but we always pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for our triune God. Blessed be your holy name. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I want to lift up my friend Michelle. Some of you know Michelle. I'm not going to say her last name, but she said it was okay if I mentioned her. I lift up my friend Michelle. And right now, Lord, we lift up Michelle to you in the name of Jesus. Uh, she has been exposed to COVID. She had no choice. She was exposed to COVID and now she feels sick. She's in another state. She's not in the state where she lives, so she's not home. And she's very concerned. She messaged me this morning and asked if we could please pray for her. So we lift up Michelle to you now, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. We, You know that we always do. But just in case someone doesn't know it, that's what we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in your name, Lord. We lift up Michelle. We pray that you would touch her body. I know she's also asthmatic. I just plead your blood over her, Lord, and pray from the top of her head to the soles of her feet that you would touch her body. I pray that that COVID virus, if it is in her body, Lord, that you would just cause it to disintegrate and evaporate, that it would have no power over her or her body. We're not name and claim it, Lord, but I ask you, will you say yes today? Will you say yes and, and touch our friend, our sister, Michelle? And will you touch her body and heal her, whatever it is that she has, because she has symptoms of something? Will you heal her, Lord, and protect her from that COVID? We ask that you would do that for Michelle, Lord, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. And Lord, we want to also pray for the, the Jean Perot family. Uh, we pray for her family. Her son-in-law Albert um, went to be went left this earth to go to heaven a few days ago. He did have COVID. He was in the hospital with COVID pneumonia, and we prayed for him. A lot of us prayed for him for like days and and weeks, and some of us prayed for long, long hours for him. And the family has prayed. So many people prayed for him, and for some reason, Lord, you decided to take him home to heaven. So we know he's standing. In your presence now and he finally sees you this wonderful man of god albert but what i want to lift up his family to you his wife Anne. i just plead your blood over Anne, lord she's so grieving and over his sister-in-law michelle and his mother-in-law jean and the whole family lord they're grieving the loss of this man that they loved so much they know he's in your presence lord but they're grieving they can't sleep at night they're in shock all of them lord i just plead your blood over all of them and pray, Lord, that your spirit will touch them with power, that they will have encounters with you, Lord, that you will be with them right in the midst of their mourning and grieving, that you will be more powerful, more powerful to them than the feelings of grief and mourning. And Lord, these feelings are real. It says in your word in Ecclesiastes that there's a time for everything. And it does say that there's a time for mourning and mourning is real and it's necessary. But I pray that their morning time will not be a time of darkness and uh, and a time that will just that will trap them and strangle them. I pray that their morning time will be a morning time of peace and love and actual joy that Albert is in your presence. But Lord, I pray that their morning will do its job, and I know it's going to take time. But I pray if there are any people who know the who know jean perot and her family that they would reach out to these women and men in this family and albert Irwin's family because these people are going to need comfort and prayer support and i pray that people would reach out to them thank you lord for hearing our prayers for this family and lord i just want to pray for right now people in general i'm not going to forget to pray about Gigi. well let me pray for Gigi first lord and i lift up Gigi to you i thank you that her covid looks like it's on the downside now it's starting to wind down a little bit she's starting to feel a little bit like oh my gosh maybe i'm starting to feel normal i pray that you would remind her uh, to be careful and not to do too much to let her body go through its healing process and i pray that you'd completely heal her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet and that you would encourage her by your spirit and that you would give her times of refreshing and uh in times of refreshing that she would be able to spend time with you that will be so I have to say that we're refreshing again, a refreshment to her, Lord. And I thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord, for Gigi. I thank you for all the time that she spent for years.
taking care of my grandsons in Christian school and daycare. And she was such a blessing to all my grandsons all those years, Lord. I thank you for that. And my whole family, how she has been a, a blessing to all of us. So I pray that you would touch her body. And Lord, I just want to lift up all the people in our Honey Prayer Book, all the people who have COVID and all the people who are grieving because a family member or a friend has COVID and maybe someone who's always gone, who has also maybe gone on to be with you. There are a lot of people grieving for different reasons, Lord. And I just lift all of them up in the name of Jesus and plead your blood over them, Lord. I pray that all these people, it's nothing for you to touch every single one of these people in this prayer book. Some of them are going through divorce and it's really messy. This one lady is going through a terrible divorce and her life is possibly in danger. I pray that you would protect her by your mighty hand. Send angels to those warring angels to camp round about her and protect her from that wicked man who loves to do harm to her. I pray that you'd protect that woman, Lord. And I protect, and I pray for, um, there was something else I wanted to pray for, Lord. Please remind me. People who are in danger. I pray for people who have a problem with anger, with rage. Lord, I pray that you would convict them and that you would take the blinders off their eyes and open their eyes so they can see how damaging their anger and their rage is to them and to other people, Lord. And I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a greater way. And Lord, I love your word because your word is truth. And I pray all these people that we pray for, Lord, that they would saturate themselves in your word to have the strength that they need to get on with their lives and to follow you. It's all about knowing you and following you. And I pray, Lord, for all of us that we would follow you more closely, that we would steal time to spend with you, that spending time with you would be the most important thing for us. It would be more important than anything else. You're the one. We say we love you so much. Well, how much time do we spend with you? So I pray, Lord, that we will do that. And I pray that you would help me to know what to do about live stream. Honey in the Rock, help me what, to know what to do about YouTube. Help me to know what to do with Honey in the Rock Ministries. Give me keen direction and discernment. Because you know, Lord, our only goal is to lead people to you, who people who don't know you, and to draw others closer to you, those who already know you. And that's our whole goal, Lord, to give you glory in our lives. So I thank you, Lord. I don't think I forgot anything I was going to pray for. Let me look around and see if I have any notes anywhere. I don't think so. I think that's it, Lord. If, if I forgot to pray for you, please send me a message and remind me. And we'll pray for you next week on Honey. And remember, Honey in the Rock, Monday at 12 o'clock, Honey in the Rock. It's been live stream on Facebook, but I don't know if that's going to happen. If we, This is the second time this has happened with technical difficulties. And there's nothing wrong with my connection here at home so I don't know what's going on but I pray Lord that you would give me direction and help me to follow you one step at a time thank you Lord that you always love me no matter what thank you and I pray for all of you who are listening anyone who hears my voice remember you are never alone God is always with you and if you don't know Jesus please Spend time and just talk to him. You can talk to him any way you want. It doesn't matter how you talk to him. You don't have to say, my most gracious heavenly father. You can pray that way if you want to, but you don't have to. You can just talk to him just like you want to talk, like you want to, talk to your best friend. Because really, guys, he is our best friend. He's my very best friend. And let's do that. Let's spend more time with him and tell him how we feel about things. And I love to just tell him when I see a, a tree that I love, I love trees. And I just say, I love that tree. Good job. And I, I just talk to him about everything. So remember, you are never alone. He's closer to you than your breath. You are never alone. And there's no such thing as being any place where you can't talk to him. You can talk to him wherever you are. So go with God and God bless you until next week. Honey in the Rock, over and out. Oh, you know what? Not over and out. I take that back. I thought there's something I'm forgetting. <coughs> I'm forgetting our song, our very favorite song. Jesus, we love you so much, and we're going to end with this very favorite song of ours. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship 
you, O oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. May I be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Go with God.